Don't worry, I'm not gonna burn my eyes out. You see, I'm only looking at it through its reflection in my camera. Seems unusually bright today. Yashapash, yashamash. Someone said that the uh, moon was taking a nibble of the sun. And I thought this would be a good opportunity with this uh, eclipse, total solar eclipse, my foot, you know, to talk about one of the most notable total, total <coughs> solar eclipses in the history of humanity, and at least for the ancient Near East. And I'm talking about the eclipse of Mersili in 1312 BCE. You see, in the 1300s BCE, Shupaluliuma, he's the top dog on the block in the Hittite Empire. The Hittite Empire. I'm gonna stop with this obnoxious accent. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's waging war, invading the kingdom of Mitanni, and whatnot. And, He's made them a vassal king dumb under him, which is bad news for the Egyptians. They're kind of distracted. They're worried about their own things, you know. They have uh, the Amarna period at this time where there's all this stress about, you know, making people only worship the sun instead of other gods. Well, in the end, uh, the Hittites push a little bit too far and they set off a war with the Egyptians by you know so the king Sutarna of Kadesh who is an Egyptian vassal but he's also allied to a lot of Mitannian vassals goes to support his friends in Katna and you know who calls that the kingdom of Nuhashe but Shutani gets easily defeated by the Hittites. And they do the same thing with his kingdom. They do with all the other kingdoms. They put his son in charge and make sure he's loyal. But there's a problem with this. Because Kadesh, unlike Gatna, unlike Duhashe, it's not merely a Mitannian vassal. It's right on that border with between Egypt and Mitanni, which means it's also an Egyptian vassal. And the Egyptians don't take so kindly to Shupiluliuma uh, invading and deposing their king, you know, their little vassal king. So the pharaoh sends Horemheb, his chief general, against the Hittites. And the Hittites kind of win the battle, actually. But they lose the war because <laughs> Horemheb brings the plague. Because there was a plague going on in Egypt. A lot of depredation, sort of, you know, around all this tumult of the Amarna heresy, all this building and not really worrying about, you know, harvests. And when you have famine, you have plague. And when you have plague in the ancient Near East with this international trade community, it goes around, you know? And the Egyptian prisoners, particularly the Asiatic prisoners who were brought back to Hattusha spread this plague to from uh, Hormheb's army to Shupiluyuma's army. And in the end, Shupiluyuma, this greatest king, this greatest general who saved the Hittite Empire from all their enemies, he dies of plague. Bitch death. But that's okay. He has an older son, dies too. Arnawanda II, he croaks from the plague, same as his dad. So who's close to the capital? We're talking about the Ottoman Empire. It's really who gets to the capital first, who gets to be the king. And in this case, it wasn't the oldest surviving son. That would have been uh, Telepinu, but he's the priest in, uh, well, uh, Tarhun Dorada, high priest. It's not the next oldest. That is Piyashili, or uh, Kushu Shalmu, or Shalmul Kushu. I know him as Piyashili. That's that's he's referred to as in the treaties. And he's the king of Karkamish. So he has his hands full dealing with 
issues of Mitani, you know. He's kind of the guy who kind of keep the the Vassal King uh, Matiwaza in line. So who does that leave? That leaves Morshali the second. And Morshali's a little bit young. So all the Vassals are like, yeah, your dad was a big man, but you're a little, little weenie boy. We need a little weenie boy. Your, your dad, he had chariots. You don't have any chariots. Your dad had an army. You don't have any army. And Mercy was like, oh. And then there's a plague. It's a big mess caused by his dad. So Mercy, you know, he turns to religion, as you do. He says, Gods, storm god of Hati. Tell him I must propitiate for the sin of my father. And if I did, it is not the sin of my father that is wrong, tell me, tell me in a dream or in a vision what is wrong and I will propitiate for you. And at around this time, we see the famous eclipse of 1314 BCE, which actually allows us to date a lot of these historical events of the late Bronze Age and, and back before then. So we're grateful for that. Mercy, he's an interesting, he's an interesting fella, you know? Oh, my goodness. So he, he is invading, all of his vassals have run off and they said, oh, you're a little boy, you're a little bitch boy. Well, they picked a, a fight with the wrong little bitch boy because he does have his infantry and his chariot trees, just like his daddy, Shupiluluma. So he goes, sword in hand, and he goes and invades the vassals in Hayasha Azi, defeats them. And he goes to Arzawa, to the city of Apasa, it's also called Ephesus, and he lays siege. But the king is defiant, obviously. But what what does uh, our Mushali do? He, go, he goes to the gods and he prays. Gods! And, and let's say, not every king gets to say with literal truth that he has a meteoric rise. But Mushali II does because, according to him, the gods send a thunderbolt that smites the knees of the king of Apasa, and this allows the defeat of the city. And most scholars interpret this as an actual literal meteorite that fell on the city at that particular time, which is pretty wild. <laughs> and there's other sources from classical antiquity that point to the city of Ephesus, the same city, Apasa, in Anatolia revering this magical stone that flew from heaven, you know, a meteor. So Mercially, he's this astronomical, you know, badass, you know, fighting wars and, and whatnot. Meteor's coming, he's the God's favorite. And this is how he justifies his reign with this religious propaganda around the eclipse. And I'm wondering, since these uh, late 1300s BC is also about the same time that the ball cycle is written. Is there some sort of semblance to that of the eclipse of the moon almost swallowing the sun to Mot swallowing ball in the land of the bear? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, proposition. I'm sure this was on the mind of the ancient Canaanites every bit as much as it was on the mind of the Hittites. They had a very close tie between Ugarit, where the ball epic was written, and the Hittite Empire, for example. And certainly around this time, we sort of see, you know, the Canaanites of northern Syria, you know, they're vassals of the Hittites now, but they kind of have a handoff situation. But they're cunning enough to not go out and outwardly rebel against the Hittites. They remain ostensibly loyal, but assert their power. So Ugarit actually grows in strength while the actually rebellious vassals in Anatolia get crushed by Mersali, you know? 
So, talking about that, of course, it, it can take over the kingdom of Mukesh, modern day Hatay province in uh, uh, Turkey. And that's a pretty big gain. It wipes out the Yamhat dynasty, which had ruled there since 1700 BCE. A dynasty like of, at that point, 400 years. It's a pretty big deal. And one much more powerful than Ugarit uh, previously. Ugarit also installs control over the city of Siyanu to the south. And they uh, get a treaty of marriage between the kingdom of Ugarit and the kingdom of Umuru, where uh, the king of Ugarit marries his son to the daughter of Aziru, the king of Amuru. Or maybe the, the daughter of, maybe the, sis, uh, the sister or daughter of Ben Tashina, who was, Agnes. Kings of Amuru, very confusing. Ben Tashina. But either way, a marriage alliance concluded between Amuru and Ugarit, peace in Syria, under the auspices of Baal. And they don't rebel against the Hittites, they break that cycle. But they still assert greater independence by playing the Egyptians and the Hittites off each other. But in a peaceful way, you know? That's how Baal brings peace to the Middle East. It took uh, another hundred years or so for the plans of Nikmadu II and his priest Ilimilku to come into complete fruition but it was this Ugaritic cult of Baal that ultimately succeeded in mediating a peace between the Egyptians and the Hittites. And when we're looking out carefully on this weird eclipse thing, I invite people to sort of uh, say, Let, let's, let's make this age an age of peace but also an age of transition away from the evils and violence of imperialism towards equality, egality, freedom under socialism. That's what we need. This should be a, a period of change. We can accomplish it with the sword. We can accomplish it with the pen, the social media videos. Maybe I'll do a little sword dance under the light of the beautiful shamash. <sighs> My camera down. Oh,
Hadi, my lord, and gods of Hadi, my lord's merciless, your servant to send me. Go speak to the storm god of Hadi and to the gods, my lords, as follows. What is this that you have done? If let let loose the plague in the interior of the land of Hadi, and the land of Hadi has been sorely, greatly oppressed by the plague under my father. Under my brother, there was constant dying. And since I became priest of the gods, there is now constant dying under me. The oldest Overcome the worry from my heart I can't overcome the anguish from my soul